And uh, I'm excited to be here with my good friend, Jason Bittner. Uh, long, long overdue chat with Jason. Been wanting to do this for some time, so I'm glad we could make it happen today. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. You know, not a lot to tell you other than um, a reminder to please subscribe to my YouTube channel, check out all the other past shows. And um, of course, everything is available as a podcast, so you can go on all the different podcast platforms, Apple, Amazon, Spotify, all the usual suspects, and you can uh, download all the podcasts. Please do. Collect them all. Um, so anyway, here we go for episode 66, live from my drum room. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to welcome today my very good friend, the man himself, Jason Bittner. Hello. And there he is. Look, at he's, he's just finishing his lunch. <laughs> Organizing my things. Yes. It's good to see you, pal. How, how are you? Um, I'm all right. How are you? Good, good to see. Good to see you. Nice to be seen. It's good to see you too. I was going to ask you, how, you guys, you and John have been like healthy Just throughout say all a little, this. By the way, oh, and Kelly and, says and much love to too, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, she sends her love to you. But you, have you guys been healthy through all this kind of crazy stuff these past like almost two years? Knock wood. Good. Knock on wood. Thank God. But, yeah. but. Convinced we both had it before it was COVID, okay? Wow. Yeah. Mega Cruise, um, which was October, November 2019. Yep. Uh, she got it. She got what she thinks could have could have been that. She was down for like three weeks, really sick, couldn't do anything, you know, just bedridden. I didn't get anything, thankfully. So I was like, shit, you know, all yeah. right. Yep. Um, and then fast forward to February 2020. Didn't get sick at NAM for once, which that was a, a, a miracle in and of itself. Okay. Didn't, That's didn't wild. get the yeah. anthrax in 2020. And I said, all right, great. I got three, I got three weeks before I'm back out here again and the tour starts because overkill hadn't been on the road. I was real excited about getting back on the road. We were starting in Anaheim. It was going to be February in Anaheim. We're going to be on the West coast. I'm going to be out of the freaking cold. <laughs> and that tour didn't go so well. I literally yeah. flew out there on my, just was just telling this story the other day to uh, my GI doctor because I went in for my you know routine and we were just talking about COVID because it's kind of hard not to talk about this subject with anybody nowadays yeah, yeah um so i told him i said i flew out there on february on february i think i would believe it was the 20th it was the monday okay now what my plan I was i your, fly your, out um what's that hang on a second jason you know what i'm not i'm not um i'm not hearing you really but it could be me i am not muted Weird. can you hear me let's see Ah, it's my it's my earbuds. Hold on a second. I don't know what happened. Yeah, because I'm not muted. Sorry, everybody watching at home. Don't know what just happened. Johnny, are you pushing buttons you don't know you shouldn't be pushing? I, you know, these earpods do that sometimes. They just sort of decide to cut out. Anyway, I apologize. You were saying it's okay. February 2020. So, so I fly out, I fly out February, I believe the 20th. It was the Monday. And my plan was I leave. I leave Albany at six in the morning. I land at 1230. I get the rental car. I'm having lunch with Aaron from Promark by two o'clock. And that's, that's what we did. I, you know, I, I met Aaron for lunch and Aaron Vishria. Yeah. Yeah. My Our friend. Rep. So, so I meet Aaron for lunch and I'm just like jet lag, you know, I'm yawning at, at lunch, but of course, Two o'clock is five o'clock our time. So it's dinner time back home. And you know, as well as I do at this point in time, it's usually yawning a couple hours after oh, dinner. No. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, whatever. I'm just tired. So I wake up the next day. Now I have Tuesday. I'm going to go to Remo. So I, 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 I flew into Anaheim, but then I drove down to, to Long Beach or wherever, you know, by Remo, where Remo is. Mm -hmm. So Tuesday, I get up. I don't sleep too well Monday night, but that's just usual. You're adjusting to the time zones. I don't think much of it. 
So February, uh, the, the next day I go to Remo. So I spend the day with, with Chris and, and Roger and Angie, have a great day at Remo, you know, taking pictures, seeing the whole factory, going to lunch, blah, 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 talking with Tempesta while we're at lunch because we're at the same place that they go with him all the time. So, you know, I got John on the phone going, is Chris ordering blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, actually he is. <laughs> so, so we're like, we're just, you know, having fun at lunch. And we have a great lunch, great day at Remo. And now I got to drive back up to Anaheim because the tour is starting in Anaheim on Wednesday. Yeah. So I drive back up to Anaheim that night. I get to Anaheim. I pick up my, my production assistant from the hotel where everybody is at the band. I take him. We go drop off my rental car because this is his first time in Anaheim. So I want to take him down to where the – and he's a drummer too. So I want to take him down to the convention center and just show him the whole area and show him what yeah. I talk about every year so he can – he can gather like, oh yeah, well when we went from the Hilton to the Anaheim or to the Marriott, and then he'll know because he saw it. Yeah. So I take him down there. We do the whole Anaheim thing. We go to Cheesecake Factory for dinner. We drop off my rental car. Go back to the bus in the hotel. I go into my hotel, my hotel room. I go to sleep. I wake up the next day. I feel okay. I'm like, all right, cool. Let's get this fucking show on the road. So you know we're loading in at House of Blues. 11 o'clock and I'm at the hotel within walking distance. I'm antsy. I'm it's 10 30. I'm like, come on, let's go. Uh, you know, <laughs> let's go. I'm, I, we ain't got all day here, which, but we do. So, so <laughs> I just want to get those drums out and look at them, you know? So we load in every the whole day goes like it goes the first day of tour, always a, you know, conundrum of some sorts. Yeah. So everything gets worked out. We do the sound check. Now, Sadly, three weeks prior, we just lost Sean Reiner. So yeah. I literally was going to meet Sean's husband and one of our other friends for dinner when I got done with soundcheck because I hadn't, you know, I hadn't seen hadn't seen Tom since Sean since I saw him with Sean last, which was probably maybe a year prior. Um so I have all this in my head because I remember it like it was yesterday. So I, I get a text from my friend for oh, you know Forrest. You know Forrest Robinson. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I'm going to meet Tom, Tom and Forrest. So Forrest texts me there downstairs at so-and-so restaurant. I'm like, okay, so I'm walking down there, right? And I'm as I'm walking down there, like I'm still backstage at, at the House of Blues, and I'm going, <coughs> what the hell? <coughs> like this, this dry, persistent cough, okay? This starts around 3.30. The whole, the whole dinner with those guys, I'm coughing. Oh, so man. back to the venue, back to the venue, <laughs> I'm coughing. The whole show, I'm coughing. After the show, I'm coughing. What the is going on? So the dry cough came in, kept me awake all night. The next morning, we we're in San Francisco. Now I'm supposed to go meet up with Anton because we had business to deal with for the shop and stuff. And he was supposed to meet me at, at uh, Slim's at, at 10.30. I woke up at some point, like in early in the morning, six, seven o'clock, because I didn't sleep at all. I finally fell asleep, like probably when the bus had stopped somewhere, maybe because, you know, to fuel up or whatever. Once we stopped moving, I had finally fallen asleep because I was just coughing. But when I woke up to call him, it felt like there was an elephant sitting on top of my head. My whole head was congested. I was like, dude, I don't know. I don't know what's wrong with me, but this is day two and I'm already sick. And he goes, Oh, well, dude, the pollen's really bad here right now. I go, bro, dude, this is not pollen right now. Trust me. Yeah, I said, this, yeah. this, this is bad. I said, there's no way I can, I can meet up at lunch. I said, meet me after sound check and we'll go to dinner. So then the plan wasn't, I wasn't going to see him till like four or five. I slept the rest of the afternoon, got up. I made it through the sound check. We went and got a little bite to eat. And I'm like, I, I just feel like shit. So I literally was back to my, I was in the bunk six o'clock and slept again till like nine o'clock. Like I didn't come in till maybe like literally a half an hour before we were to go on stage. And that's totally unlike me. I'm always yeah. in there for my routine and everything. The machine head guys were just getting back from, from Europe and they all had it too. But, but uh, Chris Contos was coming to the show just to see me and come hang out. And like, I, it was barely one of those things where like, Chris, I'm still in my bunk. When I come inside, I'll let you know. So he basically came downstairs. I said hello to him really quickly, and that was it. But Lord knows he could have still been dealing with it from Europe, and I had the onset of mine. Mm -hmm. So 
that night it just got it got worse i made it through that show i played every single night john i don't know how i made it through all these shows but i did it so the next day it was even worse i said to my tour manager I said raj i need I, I need urgent care this is it was this by the third day it was the sickest i ever been on tour and i'm like this is fucked up and i'm like not for nothing i said i couldn't wait to get out here and now i can't even enjoy any of it because I feel like death warmed over. And that's what it was. So I basically just, I slept all day as much as I possibly could. I just laid in my bunk, sweating, just nasty, having these just insane dreams. By the fourth day, we, and then, so a couple days later, it started infiltrating the bus. Didi, my bass player, got it. He had it in different ways, though. He had a fever. Mine was gone. My, first, mm-hmm. my one guitar player got it. My singer didn't get it till like another week later, thank God. But it it went through the bus and pretty much got everybody. By the fourth day in San Diego, we we're in urgent care. But at that point, they just said it was a viral infection. It's got to run its it. course or whatever. <laughs> they gave me a Z pack. So basically I just I just took everything over the counter, tried to sleep as much as possible. And, and they, they gave me the Z pack just in case. I'm like, just in case my ass, I started taking that thing the moment I could fill it. You know, <laughs> I'm like, I, I'm, I'm just going to do what I can. The worst, the worst show of the whole, the whole run uh, dealing with all that was Phoenix because I don't know what had happened. Actually, I do. I think Phoenix was a couple of days after I actually got the Z pack filled. So it might have been. It might have been the combination of me taking the the antibiotics along with over the counter meds and stuff. I may have been over medicating. Who the hell knows? I was just trying to feel better. But yeah. like usually my my routine on tour is I get up early because I'm just I'm wired like that just from being home. So I'm up early. I'm usually up before anybody else, maybe not my other guitar player, but usually one of the first. And I do all this shit during the day, keep myself occupied. And then usually after sound check, after dinner, I'll lay down for like 90, usually no more than 90 minutes. I have to keep the nap time to no, no more than 90. Cause if it's longer than that, then I get too, then I just want to stay in the bunk. Yeah. So I usually, and I know it's the worst thing to do right after you eat, but the way I look at it is like, yeah, I'm going to lay down. I just ate dinner, but I'm going to go burn it off in three hours. So it yeah, really doesn't you, matter. It and itself. your body needed sleep. It right. was telling you. Yeah. So, so yeah. I eat, I lay down. So I'm going through my normal routine. So I'm, I, like I said, I'm in Phoenix. My food comes because we're at a place that's got food too. So my food comes I'm on the phone with John. I said, all right, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to lay down for a little while because, because Mike and AK are coming. Cause the, you know, my, my ex band members from Flotsam and Jetsam were coming to the show because we were in Phoenix. Mm. And they're all friends with everybody. So I lay down for the 90 minute nap that I usually lay down for. I, I get up and like, I go to step out of my bunk and I, I sleep in the middle bunk. So I'm not right at the floor and I'm not top either, but it's still, you know, two feet down with your leg. So I go step, I step my one foot down and I get out of the bunk and like with all my weight on one foot. And I'm like, Whoa, whoa, whoa there. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> wait a second. Like, I'm all woozy. You know, I like to lean on the bunk to steady myself. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? So, so like, I'm going, all right, I'm just groggy, whatever. Just make a cup of coffee. I, I stumble into the venue. Now, meanwhile, these guys are already in the dressing room hanging out with the rest of the band. <laughs> Mike comes up to me, he goes, dude, what's, a, what's up with your eyes? And I go, why what, what's up with my eyes he goes they're totally black dude so so oh, my pupils are so dilated i went and looked in the mirror i literally looked like i had just eaten a handful of mushrooms and i was like <laughs> holy shit man and so now now that he's drawn attention to it now i like start internalizing it all so i'm like oh yeah, man yeah. maybe i shouldn't have took that cold medicine now i'm all fucked up and like literally i was i was freaking john you know me, I'm an elephant. I never need to know what song's coming next. I know. I know the parts. I know what I'm going to play. Don't worry about me. I got you covered. This is the first time in my life I went on stage. I looked at my tech and I grabbed him by the back of the shirt and I go, animal. I go, I don't know how the first song starts. Oh my God. And he goes, and he just looks at me and he goes, dude, you look fucked up. And I go, that's scary. I feel <laughs> fucked up right now. I said, I don't know how the first song starts. So then 
He's like, well, it starts with the intro. I'm like, that's not helping me. I know it starts with an intro tape, but I need to, well, you count it off. I'm like, yeah, okay. Wait. What's the oh, yeah, right. yeah. Da, 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 da. Okay, now I know how it goes. So the whole night, oh. there was never, ever autopilot. You know how you play when you play your shows? You know, you get to that point in the night yeah. where you're just like, you're not even paying attention to what's going on. And then you're like, oh, shit. Wait a minute. That, there's only like two songs left. I was just thinking about my car or thinking about what, you know, what I might stack on later or something. You're just not thinking about it. Yeah. There's yeah. no not thinking about it in this show. Every single moment I was engaged at what part comes next. Okay. Second verse. Uh, what's next? Okay. All right. All right. Wow. We made it through that one. Whew. All right. Uh, which one's next? Oh shit. How's this one start again? So did, it was did the guys like that that confusion the whole night but i made it through but like i've never dealt with that in my life so yeah. fast forward we get through this whole effing tour we have two days left and then they shut everything down baltimore show I, in, in the new jersey show which was the hometown this. show sold out lord yeah. knows how much money the band lost and merch and everything that's the one we just made up literally like two months ago uh it we're like ah, oh, two more days. Just couldn't wait two more days. But I had I'm convinced that that's what it was. It was the whole entire tour. I had it. I didn't start feeling a hundred percent literally until about a week after I was home. Like yeah. when when we got home, I pretty much was fine. I just felt like I felt like I had been on a month long tour, even though I had only been out like two two weeks at that point because of everything that all the stress on my body, it felt like it was a full tour. So yeah. I was just like, just drained. So within a week of, you know, now being quarantined in our homes, I was fine. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. I, it sounds like you had it. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm 110% convinced that that's what it was. And if it was, it was, if it wasn't, well, you know, it was, it was sure sick enough and I don't want to be like that. So you know, yeah. two shots and a booster later, here I am. And I'm not well, going to sit here and be, you know, pro-vaxxer or, or say whatever. Whatever you want to do is fine by you. But the my personal opinion is the reason why I got it is I am a professional musician. And if you think for one minute that you're going to be able to fly overseas without having this vaccination, you're out of your mind. No. So no I want to yeah. work. It's got nothing to do with, oh, I drank the Kool-Aid or you are follow this politician or bullshit. No. I want to play drums around the world. That's what I do. That's what I love to do. And that's the only way it's going to get done. Yeah. All right. No, I, ab absolutely, I Jason. I got, I got a quick, 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 quick story for you. Similar to what you just said. So, and I know the date of this, February 7th, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, my band was hired for a private party. It was a Friday night. So I believe that's the correct date. It was a Friday night. It was at a venue that we played at regularly anyway, but these people rented it out for a private party, hired us to play. Uh, one of those easy gigs where like we were getting paid, you know, for us, good money, no pressure, you know, no heavy lifting, so to speak. So anyway, <clears throat> get up that day, told Kelly, I got a little bit of a headache, but you know, I don't know, it could be, could be anything, could be low pressure. Didn't feel much. I went and had lunch at this place that I like to go have lunch at on my way to the gig. I would, my, my routine would be, I'd go visit my mom, um, rest her soul, who lived like a couple of towns over from where, where we played a lot, you know, like up in the, in the north of Boston where I grew up. So, so the routine was I'd go have lunch at this place on the way. In fact, you've probably this derby shop in, in Hingham where I think we've been before you and I near it's near Zildjian. So go to this place, have lunch. Okay. Yep. And then I'd go up and visit my mom. So <clears throat> I'm kind of, as the day's going on, not I feeling do know great. Strawberry Fair very well. Strawberry Fair, another great spot. <laughs> I, I, yeah, exactly. I can't wait to go back. There Thanks to with you. you. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm thinking that, you know, I'll feel better after I have some lunch or something. I'm, I'm, and I, I go to this place to have my lunch. I'm not feeling great still, still feeling headachey, sort of achish. And, um, I drive up to my mom's house to visit her and now I've got the chills and I'm thinking I feel feverish and I get, you know, I got my drums in the car. I'm, I'm an hour and a half from going to load in for the gig tonight. So 
I happen to mention it to my mom and she's like, well, why don't you, why don't you lay down for a little while? Well, you know, sit in this chair and take a little nap, which, which it, it was unusual for me to say, yes, okay. Cause I'm visiting my mom, but I did, I laid down and nap for probably a half an hour, 45 minutes, took my temperature. It was 101 point something. It was pretty high. I, I visit my mom. I get in my car. I drive to the gig. I load in. I'm feeling worse as time goes on. I, I get all my stuff in. I'm there before my bandmates get all my stuff in. And then I just sit down in this bench and down where we're playing. And I just sort of lay down. And as my bandmates showed up, I said, guys, don't get near me. I think I got something. It might be the flu. I don't know what it is, but I don't want to get you guys sick. And they're like, well, you're going to be okay. If you want to go home, we will, we can do it, you know, with, without you or something. And um, I'm like, no, 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 don't <laughs> well, worry about it. I'll, I'll unless they have another drummer in their pocket. <laughs> oh, I, I lost you again. I don't know why this keeps doing this. Check your AirPods. Sorry, Jason. I was, yeah. Sorry, I, I what was did you say? say? How can they send you home unless they have another drummer? No, they, they wouldn't have had another drummer and they, they, in their minds, they thought, we'll just do it as an acoustic band, which yeah, they've done gigs, yeah. but, but it, you know, I'm not trying to, I think the people that hired us would have been disappointed because they wanted a band, right. you know, they right. wanted, yeah. 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 What a and there's no way audio I, you know, what they wanted. It was too good a payday for me to go home. I wasn't gonna, I, I would have insisted on getting paid anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, so, so. I, I promise I'll finish the story. So we, we get all our stuff set up, get through, we're going through the first set. We're going to do two sets. People are showing up. It's packed now. And I'm, as the first set's going on, I'm feeling just sort of shittier and shittier and weaker and weaker and dizzier yeah. and dizzier. I'd had some soup for dinner and we got to a point at one point, I forget what the song was. I remembered at the time, but it was, I don't know what it was, but we finished the song and I looked up at the guys and I said, I need a minute. I need a minute. And I got up and I rushed from my drums to the men's room and I threw up. I oh. just ran into the stall and I just, the minute I closed the door, oh. like it was like instantly, you know, that feeling like I had no time to spare and I got sick and I, I was like, Oh my God, I can't believe this. I felt better. So I went and I kind of threw some water on my face. I tried to clean up the mess I made, which wasn't terrible. I go up to the bartenders that I know and I said, I'm really sorry. I just got sick in the bathroom. You're like, don't worry about it. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I feel better now, but I'm, I'm really, you know, and it, you know, they're like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So the guys in the band are like, just pack up your stuff and go, just go home. I'm like, no, 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 we got to finish this. We got to finish the gig. So we did, we did the next set, got my stuff packed up, got out of there, drove home. And I slept from like, whenever I got home at midnight until 10 o'clock the next morning and the next like three days I was just really in bed and I had continued to have like a fever and and uh achy body but you know not it's weird I didn't have real strong head cold symptoms but just you know some congestion um the worst thing for me was the, the persistent cough because it just kept me awake it yeah was always yeah. there even after they gave me medicine for it it still wasn't working I was like, oh Jesus yeah yeah, I did have a cough. I did. I did have that for a while. And then I feel like that was a Friday night. By the end of that week, I actually felt, you know, in, in, in about five or six days, I felt pretty good. I felt like I could sort of face the world again. And, and just when, when I introduced you before I brought you on, I was just telling everybody that for the last two weeks, I've had head cold symptoms that I was certain was COVID, but I took three home tests that were negative and a PCR test but it took a week from when I felt the symptoms to finally get a PCR test and that came back negative. So I don't know, man, it's just thankfully without. Yeah. Yeah. We, it's we heard of a matter. lot of uh, a good amount of cases after the shadow small reunion, like literally the next morning, there was some people from one of the opening bands that tested, that tested positive. So of course we were all, you know, in a state of, Oh shit. Did I see that person last night? Did I talk to yeah. them? Blah, blah, blah. Where I near them. Thankfully, all of us tested negative. My bass player has it now, though, but he says he's asymptomatic. He doesn't even feel it. But his wife and his wife and kid just had it too. We're yeah, we're yeah. still not sure if it came from the show because it was like a week after. I'm like, ah, oh, dude, I think it might. They might have got it somewhere else. So if it was within the five day period, maybe. But you know, our our light guy got it. Um, you want to hear a, a a crappy story? Christmas. 
Tony Magalino is coming up here for the holidays because his family lives in, well, his family's from Utica, but his mom lives right in Scotia. Tony, Tony, for those of you who don't know, is the director of the Drummers Collective, a very good yeah. friend of mine in Jones. Yeah, great. So job. every year, Tony and I do this breakfast for Christmas breakfast. And it's usually me, him, Brian Zink, and a couple other people up here that he knows too. So we got this plan for breakfast on Christmas Eve. It's got to be at a certain time because Tony's only available this time and Brian's got to uh, work. So we schedule this whole thing up, right? I go pick Tony up from the train station because he's coming up from New York on a Tuesday. I go pick him up in Albany. I bring him back to my house for a second to say hello to Jonna because they hadn't seen each other in God knows how long. I bring him to his sister's house where he's going to be staying for the first two days. And I go, all right, so I'm going to pick you up here on Friday. He goes, no, you pick me up at my mom's house over in Scotia. I said, okay, I, can, I know where that is. Too. No problem. The next day he calls me and he goes, dude, I'm on the train back to fucking New York. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, my sister's, my, my niece's boyfriend tested positive for COVID and I was with him all last night. And now I have, I go, are you kidding me? So he, so, and, and he's double vaccinated, boosted too. But yeah, this yeah. poor guy comes up from New York to go right back the next day. And, and he was so upset, not only because now he's got COVID, he has to deal with that, but he was just, he was telling me, he's like, it was so shitty not being home last year with my family for Christmas. It's the only time I see him. And now he's like, and now I'm going to be alone again. And I was like, dude. And yeah. That's, you know, sadly, not, and I'm sitting there going, well, thank God you didn't get it at the train station because I'd probably be sitting here right along with you. <laughs> but it was just like, I felt so bad for him. I'm like, God damn, dude. You no, know, so. Oh, he's, he's all right now now he's in, uh, i'm just fatigued and just angry <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah frustrated well talk yeah. about you mentioned the, the shadows fall reunion tour uh, show talk about that for a minute too that was a big that was a big deal yeah it was sold out right yeah yep sold out and uh actually was sold out in no uh was it november or october i think it was sold out by october actually are you guys planning to work more this year in 2022 Shadows Fall reunited on December 18th, 2021 for a one night only reunion. My birthday. That is all I was going, I am allowed and going to say at this moment. Okay. Shadows Fall reunited on December 18th for one show, 2021. Okay. All right. Jason has a tour with Overkill in March. John has tours with Anthrax starting in October. You know, like you yeah. said. It's, yep. it, it can't be, a, it can't be a priority with the two of us in, in bigger bands and in working bands and with two guys in, in Shadows Fall who have families and just can't up and leave for, you know, three to six weeks at a clip. So. I gotcha. No, and that's, that, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, could there be a potential of something down the road? We don't know. We're, well, let's just say we're open to anything that might come our way because now we've done all the hard work of actually getting in a room together and relearning the songs and becoming a band again. So, but the idea was we reunited the two to do a reunion show. And that was pretty much what we, you know, what we wanted to stick with. It wasn't like we were going to, you know, do this show and lie and say it was going to be the only show. And then now we're going to announce a tour a month later. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. that's, that's definitely not happening. Not that we wouldn't like to do it, but it's just, it's not, it's just not a logistical thing to do. Yeah. So the show was really in place now for almost three years. Um, we were going to do it in 2019, but something happened that didn't allow us to do it in 2019. I think it was one of those things where either, it was either me or John had tour dates and we couldn't commit to do it. Um, so then we said, well, maybe we'll try in 2020. And then we actually had a date in 2020 book. Like we, cause we knew we were now outside enough that we knew that we could at least uh, commit to that. Cause I knew I'd be off from Overkill. John knew he'd be off from Anthrax. So we booked the date in 2020 in 2020. And I had even alluded to that at the house of blues when I did the metal allegiance party. Cause I had, had some interview did some interview there with someone that was supposed to be an overkill interview. And then he sniped me at the end, asking me a shadows fall question, which was fine. 
But the way Blabbermouth took it and twisted it around, Jason Bitter announced the Shadow's Fall reunion show. <laughs> First of all, this is supposed to be a goddamn article about overkill. You're not even mentioning the fact that my band is going on the road. You're, you're bringing up my old band and now saying, suspending it to say something that I didn't say. That's what they do. Right. You know, yeah, and I'm like, yeah. all right, but you know what? We always go all press is good press. So let them let, let people still think we're going to do it this year. So fine. So anyways, we had the date booked, but then, you know, the pandemic started. So then once it got to be around um, maybe like October, October or so of 2020, um, we were the, the Palladium offered the date to us again for 2021. They said, we'll hold it for you another year if you want us to. And we're mm -hmm. like, absolutely. Great. So once this thing started, well, when we thought it was starting to let up and things were sort of moving in the right direction and we were able to, I was able to go to Massachusetts from New York. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, 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 we went about it in a way where we just didn't want to wait to like a month before the show and then have to do all this cramming. So since we both were, everybody was home for the most part. I mean, Anthrax had some one-offs and I had like one or two shows, but for the most part, we were home. So, mm -hmm. well, let's just start picking at this. So around July, we started getting together and we, we rehearsed like once a week for like a month, uh, maybe like two months. But it wasn't always every week because sometimes John wouldn't be here because he was doing an anthrax show or something. I wouldn't be here. I had a session one one time. So there were things that took away from it. But we were generally rehearsing like once a week from like July to September. Wow. We took a period of time where we didn't play for like three weeks because everybody had shit going on. John was away. I had something going on with Overkill. Matt went on vacation. So there was a three week period where we didn't play. So once we got back together, like late October, then we did like twice a week and then we do once a week for a couple of weeks, then we do twice a week. And then once we finally found out that Brian was actually going to come in and, and be there to rehearse before the show, because we weren't even sure if he was even going to make it in from St. Louis or not before the show. Like we knew maybe a day beforehand, but we're like, we really would like to get more than one rehearsal. And he was like, oh, no, I'm coming in like two weeks beforehand. So like once we scheduled that, we knew that we were going to have like five practices with him within the course of a two a week period before the show. So we're like, all right, we don't have to keep killing ourselves here because we're going to do that the last week. So it was really good because by us rehearsing in that manner, we were able to get everything nice and tight before Brian got there. And we were, you know, a well-oiled machine by the time he got there. And he was on top of his game from just practicing by himself at home. So it made it very seamless. But it was, it was also, we also didn't say, here's 16 songs, everybody bring them to practice next time. We're like, you know, let's, let's do this record by record. So what we did was we started with the first record and we said, what are we going to do off this, this album? Are, what what are we definitely going to do? What might we potentially do? So we learn those five songs first. And then I think we, yeah. we played four of them. So then we went to the next record. Okay, what songs do we definitely have to play? What songs would we like to play? We picked five. I think we played three. So boom. Then again, once we got to the war within, well, that's our biggest record. This is a little different. We have to play this. We have to play that one. We were nominated for a Grammy with this one. This one was in Guitar Hero. So that, you know, that's like a lot of our set, but that's our biggest album. So it yeah. should be. Yeah. So once once we got to the later records, we we went a little less with the songs. Like Threads of Life, we did one one song. The Retribution, we did two songs. And then our last and the final record, we did one song. Because a lot of thing, a lot of it to do, a lot to do to do with that is that we have we're a band that tended to write longer songs because it, so if we have 16 songs in the set, that's an hour and 45 minutes of music. That's not like an hour and 20 minutes. That's a, we have long songs. And yeah. we realized that as we're re-rehearsing and stuff, we're like, we also we kept saying it so many times, like, 
why the fuck are these songs so long? Why do why do we do this to ourselves? <laughs> oh, let's see how many notes we can play here. <laughs> so it's just funny, you know. We're like, well, do we have any like three or four minute songs? And someone's like, yeah, destroy our sentence. It's already in the set. Huh? All right. Well, okay. Well, looks like we're gonna keep it at sixteen because we had <laughs> we had eighteen planned at first, and then like by one rehearsal, like all of us were like this is a lot of shit, man. I mean, I know we haven't played in seven years because we went, we went the total different gamut with it. Like at first, at first they said 75 minutes set. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. Absolutely not. I'm like, that's just not, we haven't played in seven years. I said, all, all I know is if I was a fan paying money to come to the show and coming in a pandemic, chance of getting sick and you played for 75 minutes, I'd be like, fuck you guys. So I'm like, we got to do 90 minutes. We have to yeah, do 90 minutes. Yeah. So, and I, you know, I looked to John. I'm like, come on, John, you, you can agree with me on this. You're in a, you're in a legacy band too, just like I am. Got to give the fans what they want. He's like, yeah, I know, but I was hoping this is our band and we could play less. <laughs> and I go, yes, it is our band and we can make the rules, but not the first time out. We can't, we got to give the people what they want. Yeah. So it's like yeah. the kinks. That's record, the right you know? thing. Yeah. So we had, we, that's, we, that's we prepared 18 songs and there was about an hour and 40 minutes. So we chopped to, we got it to a nice hour, 35 minute mark. And that's what we went with. And why is the Amazon guy knocking on my door right now? Uh Oh, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Maybe it's, maybe it's a piece of my New York Eric Trimble kit. See, this is what happens during a live show, folks. Anything can happen. Uh, that, was, that was just a notification knock, John. Just, just knocking to let me know you left the uh, Just, just a notification. Front door. Notification yeah. knock. So let me let me ask you a question about preparation for this because I was curious. Like, oh yeah, did ask you, away. Did, well, I want like so in preparation <laughs> for for all these tunes that you hadn't played in a long time. Did you like? practice them on your own, like play to the tracks through your headphones, like on your own to sort of remember your, like dust off the, the first, parts. And so first, you'd of be... all, first of all, I never stopped playing Shadows Fall songs when the band were on my age. It's my baby. You know, those are, mm -hmm. those are, those are parts that I'm really proud of. And I realized this going back and relearning some of my things, but I didn't really have to relearn this stuff. I've always been playing yeah. You have to remember all, all this stuff with any band, going back to my days in Stigmata, being a hardcore band in here in 1993, 94. Once I record, once I write these parts, record them, play them so many times, they're there. They don't go away. Yeah. It, the muscle memory might, might not be up to snuff or something. I have to work on a little bit or something, but it's the memory's always there. I always remember what to do. Yeah. But yeah. This is the thing too, that you have to remember too, prior to going into this reunion, what was I doing for the last year? That stupid streaming channel called Twitch. And I'm gonna say stupid streaming channel because it was more so aggravating and annoying than it was satisfying and fun. I mean, I understand some people probably take that the wrong way. Well, why were you on there then? I'll be totally straightforward why I was on there because I was looking for it to be a money-making platform. I am an artist. I need to, I don't, I don't make any money if I'm not touring and, and, and out playing music. This yeah. is the only way I can do this from my studio, doing yeah. these stupid streams, trying to beg for subscribers and beg for raids and, oh, let me get more followers and all this bullshit. And, and I, I know I, I sound very negative with it because it was negative, John. It, 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 it started sapping my desire to play drums because I felt like I had to just get in there to get that stream up. And then I, all this money I'd have to put into it, buying more equipment, buying better equipment. Oh, now the stream is too slow. I got to buy a new computer. All this shit that I put into it, I did not get out of it. And if anything, I got just a yeah. few people I made relationships with, people friend-wise that were cool. And, but aside from that, it was just nothing but a shit show. But it kept my chops in shape because I was doing two to four streams a week of playing all this extreme metal stuff and going through and doing Shadows Fall sets and Overkill sets and Slayer sets and whatever 
people asked me to do and then didn't tip me for later. So it, it was just like when I started doing the math on it, some people do it and they're great at it and they're successful and God bless them. I spent 30 years trying to build my career in the real music business. I don't have time to, to try to build it in the streaming world because I don't want to be a part of that. I want to be a real drummer that plays in front of real people, not someone out in yeah. cyberspace land. So it, like I said, the day that I took those cameras down, it was almost like a weight off my shoulder, not having to have someone watch me play drums every single time I played drums. That got annoying too. I don't, when you make a mistake and you're like, oh shit, how many people just saw that? And, and, and that's where my head goes. And it, and, it, and it shouldn't be like that. It should be, I should go to my room and not care what happens here. This is, I'm supposed to have fun here. And it just yeah. wasn't fun. Like I said, it was, it was sapping it for me. And I finally came to a conclusion after about a year, I was averaging $300 a month for 30 hours of work. That's $10 an hour. I can go stock shelves at Hannaford for double that money. So yeah. that was another, another <laughs> goodbye, Rich. <laughs> goodbye. Well, you, that's, you know what? It, I hate to sound so cliche, I, but I live know, and learn. I, so live John, learn. I've, I've gone off on a giant tangent, but to wrap it up, it kept the Shadows Fall material fresh for me because I was always playing it. But this is, the, this is the one thing I want to add to it. So going into this, I went in with a very big head. Not big head like I'm going to know everything and none of these guys are going to know anything. But I just went in feeling very confident. Like, I know all these songs. I don't have to worry about it. I play them all the time. But when you play them in a band setting, it's very different from playing them to the record. It's a different story. You're yeah. playing to a recorded thing. The band's already said everything. Blah. When you're making that music together, it's a totally different thing. And then, then I start second guessing things and then I start forgetting parts. And then like, I got to a point. So my point is I went in, I went in up here and then like within like the first few months, my confidence level started coming down more. And I'm like, <laughs> and I come home sometimes and I just be like shaking my head and John's like, what's the matter? I'm like, I played like shit today. I said, I don't even know how to play my own songs anymore. Well, was it really that bad? No, just dumb mistakes. But I'd come home feeling like I just wasn't nailing the stuff like I used to. But mm. I was just totally, I really was just, really just in my, in my, my in, own head. In your head. But they started I looking totally... back to practices and stuff. I'm like, yep. dude, this is fine. There's nothing, nothing wrong with this. So I did, I did think it was going to be for me easier than it was, but, but it, but it wasn't, but it proved, it proved to me a lot of things, John, that all these years, I'll be quite honest with you, all these years were in the beginnings the beginnings of my career, I always was looking for something else. I was always looking for something else. I was always looking to what's going to be the next thing for me. What am I going to do? What can I accomplish? What can I, what can I outdo myself with this time? And, and I don't know if that was really always the best attitude to have. I know it's good to drive yourself and whatnot, but sometimes you have to take a step back too and go, dude, what you're doing right now is fucking totally fine you don't have to like really reinvent the wheel every single damn time yeah. and when i went back and i started listening to some of these songs and i come in from playing them and going and i'm not saying this to pat myself on the back and go oh look how good i am but there was sometimes i'm coming in going holy shit this guy on this record's pretty fucking good like and forgetting that it's me and going yeah, yeah. Why, why were you second guessing yourself all the time? What, it's because, oh, because some kids said, oh, you don't play blast beats or whatever. And that goes in your mind. It, this was all fine. And it just, it, it got me a chance to, to rethink about everything yeah. that I've done and sit back and go, you know something, you did succeed at doing something and you should be really proud of what you, what you did do instead of worried about what you didn't do. That's a totally, that's great, Jason. That's, I think people watching that should, should take that away. And I was going to say, that's a totally normal thing though, for you to be that way, to, to question yourself. If being the professional that you are, that friends of ours, like Steve Smith or, or, you know, Mike Mangini name, name any, you know, great drummer, you know, you, we Vinny. both know a million of them. Yeah. Vinny that, that will constantly not, and, and not beat themselves up, but they'll, 
they'll think to themselves, am I really doing this the best I can do it? And I know you, I know that's how you are. I know that's, you know, I remember when we did the clinic tour together and every night, every night you absolutely killed it. There was never one time when you didn't, you know, you'd be playing the tracks, you'd, you'd you know, of course, play a drum solo. There was that one, I think it was in St. Louis when your bandmate was there, where you like, yeah. the heavens opened yeah, up. Brian was you, there, yeah. That drum solo was like, I, I remember that was like a notch above. But That was a good one. I really like that one. That's why I left that as my YouTube page solo for like years until, and I would, because I and it, like people ask about that too. It's like, why well, your YouTube page solo is like from like 2013. I'm like, because I haven't outdone that one yet. That's why. That's like, right. Yeah, yeah, I've done There's one since that. that, but it's not as good. <laughs> yeah. Well, so my point was that I remember this. <laughs> that you you would record everyone you had your zoom camera you'd record every every night and you would watch it at the end we'd go back to the hotel i would go to sleep you would stay up and watch it and critique yourself and you'd say to me the next day like an idiot <laughs> <laughs> i didn't say that but you'd say to me the next day on the on the flight yeah. to the next city and you'd be like yeah man I, I i watched last night man i don't know there were a couple of spots where i gotta fix this and i'm like jason fucking killed man it was amazing he'd be like yeah it was you know but it, it, it had some moments but i gotta so i and again i, this I is, think you of, know you mentioned steve and this is this is one of those traits that i take right from him because he does all the same shit yeah yeah and Vinny too i, I was gonna yeah. say and Vinny, Vinny, you know was i i haven't talked to him about this recently but there was a time when he was we'd talk about stuff and he was his own worst critic about you know ungodly type playing where he'd go ah you know man you know whatever i mean you know any 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 great artist who's trying to always be better is gonna i think look at it that way sure. um yep. but and speaking of steve i gotta say i just I, I just remember before we started working together we had only sort of known each other a little while in the early 2000s and you did a a drum camp with steve and horacio and dave weckel maybe drum fantasy camp Drum Fantasy Camp, right, of course, famous drum fantasy. And by the way, today's Dave's birthday, so if Dave Weckl oh, happens it? to be watching, happy birthday happy to Dave Happy birthday, Weckl. Dave, fellow Capricorn, I'll have to text our, him. Our good buddy. Yeah, and yours is like the 15th? Mine's the 11th. Mine's next the 11th. Week. Okay, next week. Right. November, uh, January 11th, everybody. Mark that date <laughs> down. But anyway, I remember Steve, talking to Steve after you guys did that fantasy camp together, and you were, you were playing Minel Symbols at the time. We knew each other and we were friends. Yep. Um, and Steve said to me, you got to get, you know, you, you need a guy like, he said, you need Jason Bittner to be playing Zildjian. He said, you need a guy like him who's like a serious, like serious he credentials. Check after he told you that too. That <laughs> <laughs> no, he did. I remember he was, you know, Steve, he's very philosophical. Yeah, he's like, absolutely. He's, yeah. Yep. And he was, he was saying to me like, you know, you got, you got all these other guys on your roster but you need like a guy that's that's respected and you know has the credentials like as a metal drummer but can play all this other shit like he said and i remember him saying like oh, i love that he's, man yeah. he's a legitimate drummer he said he can play latin he can play jazz he reads music and you know just that really impressed steve just a testament to that is the fact that he that he did that you know the little drum solo thing with me when the pandemic first started like when yeah. we did that thing, the, the leaving on the nines thing. I was like, Steve, you want to do something? He's like, yeah, that'd be fun. He's like, I'll come up with something. Like, do you know how how many drummers would love to do a duet with freaking Steve Smith? I but he's know. like, yeah, sure, buddy, no problem. I, that he's still one of the ones that just blows my mind. But that's that he's given me so much great advice over the years and and so many different things. Especially just going down to the per and literally, it goes back to when we first first was becoming friends and i asked him i told him i said my first clinic's going to be at the modern drummer festival you got any i said do you have any suggestions he goes, yeah do one before that one <laughs> <laughs> that's the advice you could have given me I, I did i did so the mp yeah. fest wasn't my first one out of the box yeah that's good advice yeah. speaking of drum clinic i i think i've told you this story when when you did PASIC, um 2005 i think was a year because that was the year steve Steve Gad was there and um that was the that was the metronome year yes yeah I believe Steve the metronome that's right that's right and I remember going to going to your clinic <laughs> I had Steve with me we poked our heads inside the door and uh and it was one of those giant auditoriums and you were you know 
of course, and you, you know, you, you were playing to tracks and you were killing it, but it was so loud. Steve couldn't hang. He, you know, oh, I'm I, sure he, he couldn't. And you know he what? wanted to say hello to you. He said, tell him, tell him I thought it was great. He said, I, but I, so I, he left and I hung for a few more minutes, but anyway, let me tell you, let me tell you an amazing story <laughs> about the night before that. Cause now I can, now I can tell you this story because nobody will get in trouble. <laughs> Steve, Steve couldn't hang. Jason could barely hang that morning too. Oh my God, I was so hungover. Oh Jesus! I think you, I think you did tell me this. Yeah, I was with, I was with the Minel guys first, and then that spiraled off to me, Gene, and Kevin in Kevin's room. We got kicked out of Kevin. We got caught smoking pot in Kevin's room. And Kevin got kicked out of his hotel, and he was freaking out. He was going. Dude, Maury's gonna kill me. Maury's gonna kill me when he finds out about this. And G and Jesus, like, dude, dude, relax. You can I never stay in my this. room. No one's gonna know. I got two beds. You're gonna be here at Payson. No one's gonna know that you got kicked out of the room. Maury's gonna kill me. And I'm just like, I'm just stone standing outside going, oh my God, what the <laughs> so, so finally, so we, you know, that was the moment that finally sent us to bed, like at you know, two or three in the morning. That clinic was like 11 in the morning. I was sound checking at 10 o'clock. I look over, I see yeah. Skip Haddon, my old instructor from Berkeley, waving. I'm going, oh, Jesus, this, this, I don't want him here now. No. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. That was, such, that was such a great night and such a great passing. But now, now we can tell. Now we can tell the tale because since Kevin, Kevin hasn't worked there for quite a long time. But yeah, that's the untold story. <laughs> I never heard that. Yeah, and, and you know what, Murray, Murray, Murray eventually did call him out on it too. He said it, it, it was like a year later, but he actually did bring it up. He's like, "Oh yeah, um, what happened with the hotel room at Pasek?" And I forgot <laughs> what he told him. But <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, oh that's too funny. Uh, and I, I forgot, well, I, I, rem I was thinking about this before we got together that you were at Berkeley, you went to Berkeley. Um, what you, you were there in the eighties, like late 89. 88, 89. Okay. Yep. So I, I just moved back from LA, but I, I hadn't, I hadn't met you at that point yeah. um, till a couple of years later, but yeah. 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 No, it, when you, when you went to Berkeley, had were you, you were already like, you could read music. You were already that far advanced to where yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. obviously i had was... been i had been taken i knew i was gonna have i knew my reading was gonna have to be better so my my senior year i really i really buckled down on that with my my high school teacher who was don bush and don bush god rest his soul was the biggest drum teacher in this area but he was uh he was also a graduate of the new england conservatory and he was your oh. father-in-law's roommate no kidding. I think you told Don, me this when you say that. Yeah. Don created the Bolero stick. Okay. I'm going to mention this to, to Tracy, my sister-in-law and, and my wife. Yeah. yeah ask him, ask him if, if yeah. they ever mentioned Don Bush. Oh, they'll, they'll know who he is for sure. Yeah. yeah. Don Bush. Okay. So, so Don, Don really helped me get my reading together. Don is the one who instilled stick control in me as one of the most important books to use. And I've, that probably translated into me teaching for years of just what I learned with him through that book. But it wasn't just stick control. It was that it was the Wilcoxon book. It was the Garwood Whaley books. It was just, it was getting my hands together more and, and getting the reading better and, and getting me out of, okay, there's more to life than Slayer Metallica and Rush right now. So, cause I knew I was going to need those tools to, if I wanted to go to that school. Yeah. And that's, that's, I wanted to bring that up because I think that's huge that you can speak to that for young drummers that want to play like Jason Bittner that need to understand your vocabulary. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, you, I mean, you have all that, all that technique, all that, all those amazing chops, but you also have this other side of you that not a lot of guys that play the style that you play can say they have you know what i, I mean spent like four months this year playing swing shuffles and and kind of big bandy kind of stuff um i don't know if you're you're paying attention to other crap i was doing i did this band with Didi, my bass player in overkill it's called Didi verney and the cadillac band it's a big band mm. but it's like rockabilly swing it's a lot of shuffles it was a lot of you know getting my jazz chops back to you know to do that stuff and play it with conviction. So there was a good, there was a period from like April to August of this year where I really wasn't playing double bass and 
worrying about the shad stuff. I luckily was keeping it kind of fresh because I was playing with them once a week, but I was like, I was home. Ting, 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 yeah. And working on that stuff. And it That's really, great. it, I really think that it helped my plane because I had those, I had that, that technique, but I hadn't used them in so long. I really think that spending some time working on that stuff really got that stuff back up to snuff for me a little bit better than it was. And I think it was really beneficial to me because I think it actually enabled me to kind of ease up on my playing a little bit. Yeah. Probably and, and, made and I'm trying to do that as I get older and, and not just be, you know, ugh, killing the drums all the time. Yeah. And I don't yeah. do that on purpose, but I just, I play hard. That's the way, that's just the way I play. Um, but you don't have to play through the drums. Yeah. Like yep. you know, Neil used to say. Well, a perfect segue. Cause I, I and I, and I, I was going to shift gears for a second. Um, noticing your t-shirt and and knowing that we were in touch and I, and I, first of all I want to thank you because I lost my big hero this past year 2021 and you you reached out to me and and I so appreciated that that I I knew you know, how that day was affecting you because it was exactly the way January 7 2020 affected me I knew it as soon as I saw that you're the first person I thought about I'm like oh my god Charlie watch past and then John's got to be by the side himself and sure. I was, and I, and I remember when Neil passed and, and, and I, I, I remember how it affected me and I didn't know him anywhere near the way you did. I wasn't anywhere near as, I mean, I knew him, you know, peripherally, so to speak, from a business standpoint, but I wasn't his close friend like you. And I thought maybe you might on a, on a sort of more uh, positive note, maybe share a couple of like, I know you got tons of stories, but a couple of funny stories. And uh, Absolutely. You know, um, <sighs> You know, I, I don't, I also don't want to paint a picture of like, you know, I don't want people to be like, oh, well, he was like best friends with Neil. I was not best friends with Neil. I, was I friends with Neil? I absolutely was. Yeah. Was I in his circle? Yes, I was. How do I know that? Well, I was asked to be part of his 61st, 65th birthday uh, tribute thing. So I, I know that I was in the, the, the realm to a certain extent. So that, that's yeah. the thing. But in the, in the, in the, well, it was that it was it's a long time. It was over a decade that I knew him. So I mean it's funny how time passes, but in the in the in the in the decade plus that I knew Neil Peart, um, we did become friends. And it was it's probably the big my biggest achievement as a musician, really, is for me to say that I was friends with Neil Peart, because I was. And there's a lot of drummers that want to say that. There's a lot of drummers that want to say I met the guy and, and mm -hmm. never got a chance to. I was just really, really lucky. I, I'm really, really lucky. I think also one of the reasons why he gravitated to me too is, is I was a peer at that point when he first heard of, let's go back to how, even before I knew he heard my drumming, because that was right when they were going to do Vapor Trails and we were working with Nick Rascalanis before he hooked up with Rush. We were doing Threads of Life with Nick as he was going to start pre-production because he was telling me, he's like, dude, he goes, I'm, I'm going to meet the guys next week. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like he was just telling me all the stories as, as they were unfolding when he was first starting to work with Rush. So I know Neil heard my stuff through Nick because Nick had told me about it. But prior to this, I had met Lauren a few years prior at NAM at a Promark party. And uh, well, at a, at a Promark shindig in a, in a hotel room at, at, a, at, a, at a hotel room at NAMM. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I was, you know, chatting with Neil, I think it was 2006. And or I was chatting with Neil, I was chatting with Lauren and I was just like, oh man, I, you know, just, you know, on my fanboy fetish thing. And he's like, don't worry, bitch, he knows who you are. And I go, no, he doesn't. Cause that's what Lauren <laughs> calls me. Lauren calls me bits. I think he's talking always, about always Lauren Wheaton, bits everybody. For, for yeah. some, for some reason. He's like, don't worry, bits. He knows who you are. I go, no, he doesn't. He goes, yes, he does. I go, no, he doesn't. And he's actually like, like, I think he grabbed me. He's like, yes, he does. I'm like, all right, cool. Great. But then Nick Rascalinas told me that he played him something off threads of life. And he goes, yeah, Neil liked it. He said, he made a mention about, you know, the way you use the splashes or something. And I'm like, oh, did he say he copied that right for me? Because that's exactly <laughs> what I probably did. But it was just, it was nice to get some kind of 
accolade knowing that my hero kind of yeah thought what i did was all right yeah. so that's huge man so that get bigger year, than that that year was when we were when we met for the first time it was 2007 when they were coming through saratoga and lauren had told me when we come through saratoga call me i'll make it happen but I just thought he was being nice to me because this was before Lauren and I really became friends. It's only the first time I met him. So I just mm -hmm. thought he was being nice. I didn't want to bother the guy. But I already had an in for backstage because we were on Atlantic Records too at the same time. So I called my, my radio guy, Lou Rizzo. Hey, you got any uh, hookups for backstage for Rush? He's like, absolutely. He goes, I'm going to actually be there. He goes, I'll put you on the VIP thing. I'm like, great. So I already knew that I was going to be, I was going to get to go to the meet and greet, at least meet Alex and get it. So my wheels start turning and I'm going, hmm, let's see here. I'm going to hit up every single possibility I can to try to meet my idol. <laughs> so I had just, just was shooting my instruct in my instructional with, with Hudson. Paul Siegel has a house up here in Saratoga. Well, at least he used to. I don't know if he still does. But Paul Siegel used to have a house in Saratoga up here. And I said to him, I go, hey, Paul, I said, when Rush comes through this summer, are you going to be up here? And he goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I am going to be going to the show. He goes, um, you know, Rob and I are both going to be there. We got to talk about Neil, to Neil about his upcoming DVD. This is before he did anatomy of a drum solo. And I go, oh, really? You think there's any way that you maybe can just get like five minutes with one of your other Hudson artists just to maybe say hello? Oh, I don't know, Jason. You know, he's real closed off. He I'm like, I know. I know the whole story. I, I know how he is. I know. I know all that. Can we try? Uh, let's, let's see as the time gets closer. Okay. Day of the show. Paul calls me up. And I remember this like this was yesterday because this is, this is how he said it. And I, I just, I just started dying. He goes, Jason, it's Paul Siegel. <laughs> it's Paul Siegel. He goes, are you sitting down? I go, yeah. He goes, Neil has agreed to meet with you. And that's how he said it. Neil has agreed. Like the Godfather has agreed to have a sit down. <laughs> I was like, yes. I immediately called Mike Portnoy. I'm like, it's happening. It's happening. And he goes, whatever you do, don't talk about drums. I'm like, I know, I know. Don't bring up drums unless he does. I know. So, so now... <laughs> I tell John, I go, get ready. We got to get in the car and go. Paul goes, how, how soon can you be here? I said, 45 minutes. He goes, great. He goes, be here in 90. I said, no problem. I grabbed my Slingerland artist snare drum, my first one, before I bought all those other five that I just showed you like an hour ago. <laughs> I grabbed my Slingerland artist snare drum. I put it in the car. We go up the stack. I text Paul. All right, hey, we're here. All right, cool. Come on, uh, go over to so and so, and we'll meet you over here. Met him, got some credentials, went back. So now he goes, just go into the meet and greet first, and then when they're done with the meet and greet, so that way you can go see Alex and Getty again. I'm like, oh, awesome! Great. And and when they're done with the meet and greet, then we'll get Bubba. Okay, great. So so now. I'm in line for the meet and greet with my wife and Lauren comes popping by and he goes, bitch, why the hell are you standing in that line right there? And I go, cause this is where I was told to stand. And he goes, why didn't you call me? I go, I thought you were just being nice. He goes, I didn't tell you to call me for no reason. I'm like, all right, well I'm here now. So <laughs> I can hear Lauren <laughs> say that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I'm standing here with a snare drum. Now all these other people are looking at me like, some some people knew who I was, and then some people were like, "Who is this guy standing here with a drum? And why is he still standing here after we meet these guys? Why is he not being pulled out? Because they knew that I was going to meet the man." <laughs> so I'm just stand off this. Well, actually, so we we the meeting we happens we go through last. We let the paying people go through first. We go through last. Just talking to the guys, I'm like, "Hey guys," I said. Jason Bentner, Shallow Small, remember we met at the Atlantic offices and Alex like, oh yeah, that's right. Hey, how you doing? Give me a hug, you know, Getty remembered too. So we're just, you know, chatting. Me and my wife took a picture with those guys. Now we're standing off to the side with Lauren and my buddy Lou, who was working for Atlantic at the time. Paul comes through, they bring us backstage and they go, okay, you wait here and we're going to go get Neil. I'm like, all right. So now my wife's got the camera out, right? 
and Michael comes by. Now, this is also before Michael knows me too. And Michael, Michael comes by and he looks at my wife and he goes, he just shakes his head no. And I just go, put the camera away, put the camera away. And then he walks like the other way and I go, and if you think for one second we're not taking the picture, you're out of your mind. So, so, so he tells us to put the camera away. So now I'm standing here, I'm standing in the hallway of, of Saratoga Performing Arts Center, all these shows that I've been to, I've played there myself before. And I see Neil walk down the hallway and it is like, this is what I can hearken it to because, you know, he was six, five, you know, remember the Bigfoot movie where he gets caught like lumbering like that. <laughs> he literally lumbered by, he walked by just yeah. like fucking giant Bigfoot and John, I swear to God, I lost my breath for a second. He took my breath away. When he walked by, I went, I actually gasped. I was just like, Oh, oh my God, there he is. I, That's I, so great. I immediately was 14. I was like, oh my God, I'm going to fucking meet him. So we went That's in the room. Great. That's great. Paul was, Paul was the introduction, you know, was the, the mediator between the two. And Jason Bittner, Neil Parrott, I stick my hand out. I said, Mr. Parrott, it is an absolute honor to meet you. And he grabbed my hand with both hands and he said, I hear we have a mutual friend in Nick Raskolinis. And that's all he had to say. That's all he had to say. And it opened up the floodgates. There was yeah. no, there was no awkwardness. awkwardness. Yeah. There was no yeah. nothing. It was, it was, this is the drummer who worked with my producer before I worked with him. Cause that's really what it was. I was the, I was the guy who was being produced by his producer yeah. before he was. That's so, so cool. You know? So we talked about Nick and working with Nick and we were both laughing at Booge, Booge, which is, I experienced Booge before he even called him Booge. <laughs> so it was just, we had that, that kinship already. Yeah, so yeah. not only did we start talking about drums, he goes over to his practice kit and he goes, because we start talking about him studying with Peter. And he goes, you want to see what I'm working on? And I'm like, uh, what? <laughs> he goes over to his kit puts a metronome on and he starts showing me the exercises he's working on with Peter Erskine. And I'm going, yeah, this is not happening right now. Wow. Like seriously, like I'm just thinking of my mic in my ear. Don't ask him about drums. And I'm like, <laughs> I didn't ask him. He's showing me right now. Man. So he's just showing me this shit. And I'm going, this is amazing. And I like, it was 10 minutes, but it felt like it was forever. And I said, Neil, look, we got to go. We're going to get out of your hair because I know it's your warm up time. He's like, no, 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 it's all good. I'm like, I know how precious this last half hour is. It's like, I know you, you know, he's like, no, no, we're fine. We're fine. Just stay a couple more minutes and we're talking. I'm like, well, would you mind signing my snare drum? He's like, sure. So he's sitting on the chair and he's looking at the snare drum. And I'm wondering what he's reading. I'm like, what are you reading? He's like, oh, I'm just looking at what you wrote on your snare drum. He goes, I like to, I like when I, I like to read people's snare drums when they write notes on there and stuff. I have like a set list or something written on there and like some music notation or something. I said, I think it was like a solo part or something I was working on. And he goes, oh, it's good that you can write it out. So it was just cool, you know? So he That's goes to so sign cool. it. And I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he goes, what? I go, can you, can you sign the drum for me? He goes, oh, you want me to sign the shell? I go, oh, absolutely. I said, you can sign that head. Someone stupid could take the head off and get rid of it. I said, no, I want you to sign the drum. <laughs> Jason, happy drumming, Neil Parrott. Oh. So that was the first one. So, so literally... So cool. That was our first meeting. We're going to leave. We're going to leave. And we say our goodbyes and everything. And, and, and I see Michael over there, you know, like no pictures. And, I, and my wife goes, so Johnny goes, she goes, Neil, can I ask you? Or, or, or actually, no, what I, I said at first, I said, I said, I said, it was such a, such great, so great meeting. And I said, would you mind if we took a quick picture? And he goes, oh, absolutely. So I just looked over at Michael and just smiled. <laughs> I just said his smile and I'm like <laughs> overruled. Yeah. <laughs> overruled. So, so we take the picture of Neil between the two of us, right? And then my wife goes, uh, excuse me, Neil. And he goes, Yeah. She goes, Would you mind just taking one just alone by by it alone with him? He's been waiting his entire life to meet you. <laughs> and then he goes, and he goes, and he goes, I goes, of course. He goes. We wouldn't want that last one to end up in a settlement one day now, would we? We both <laughs> just dropped. We were laughing so fucking hard. Just oh. so, like, within, I've met this man 15 minutes ago and he's already that comfortable that he's busting balls like yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Like, I was dying. I was just, I was laughing so hard. So we took the picture again. We took the picture of me and him. 
shook hands, the one I always put up on Facebook. And I go, I, look, I said, I took a picture with him that time. Every other time that I, I saw him or was with him, I didn't feel the need to capture that moment because I had one with him. I had yeah. a picture. Yeah. It yeah. didn't have to be, here's me and Neil in 2009. Here's me and Neil in 2012. Here's me and Neil at the farewell show. No, I, you know, I knew the man. I didn't have to document it every single time I saw him. Yeah. So that was oh, the first one. Great, man. Another one that I want to talk about was another time when we went to go see him. Every, every time, the one thing I want to point out too is every time since 2007, we were on that guest list. Whether or not I was in town or not, the Bittner family was on the Rush guest list and had tickets and passes every single time. There were years that I was on tour. Neil still would reach out. Do you want tickets for your wife? Absolutely. One year, my parents wanted to go. He set them and he always great seats, always took care of them. I always got a note later on from him. So that just shows the type of person he was. So I think it was the R40 tour we went and we went backstage and I was reading Ghost Rider at the time. Mm. And we, we started talking about that and I brought something up that I knew that he didn't know. Um, and I think it took, it took him aback a little bit for, for a second um, because there's a section where he's talking about in Ghost Rider where he talks about Dimebag Daryl being shot and, you know, talking about how I never thought I'd see the day where we'd have to worry about security and someone being killed on stage like that, you know. And, and I, was, I was just taken aback that Neil, that was on Neil's radar and he wrote about it because first of all, yeah. I mean, <laughs> You know, hold on. Let you know. Let me show you. You know that that hits home because this picture says, "Can't wait to see at Nam next year." Dime, and this was you know, right before he was killed. So, I said to Neil, "I go, I can't even believe that was on your radar." I said, "You know something?" I said, "I I could have been there." And he goes, "What?" I go, "That happened." a day after my band left a tour that we were on with him and his brother for six weeks prior to that. And he goes, I didn't know that. I said, that was a, that was a one-off show that they were doing to get home before Christmas. I said, that could have happened. And by that end of the tour, I was telling him, I said, we were all hanging out on stage. Every time we played, if we played damage plan was on stage watching us. And if, you know, they played, we were on stage watching them. I said, there's, and I got choked up when I was talking about it, thinking about Diamond Vinny. I said, there's a chance I might not even be here talking to you right now if this happened the night prior. And he just put his hand on my shoulder. He's like, let's not, let's not talk anymore about bad stuff like that. So, you know, it was something that he knew that that hit home, home to me. So, but that was, but that time, and when I left him that time, that was the first time I got the Neil hug. And I, I literally turned to, I turned, I melted. <laughs> I went to, you know, we say goodbye. Well, Neil, once again, thanks so much. Thanks for the hospitality. Can't wait to see you, see you play tonight. Thanks. Thanks for seeing, you know, thanks for everything. As soon as I stuck my hand out and pulled me in and I was like, until Michael tapped me on the back and said, all right, you got to let him go now. <laughs> <laughs> let him go. No, no, let him go. <laughs> Oh man, that's he was the you, greatest. Yeah, you can, you can, and the, you know, the great thing is you'll have those memories forever, man. That's yep. just, that's so great. That's so great. Yep. I'll tell he you one thing right now because I talk about this with John. I've been spending the last three years building my Candy Apple Red tribute kit. Um, yeah. That, you know, it's been on Facebook. I know I built the exit stage left one, but that one I recently sold because I got the Candy Apple one together finally. I just have to finish getting the drums refinished, fixed build it, yada, yada, yada. It's going to take probably at least six months. But the point is I have all the pieces to the puzzle. I can tell you right now, and I joke about this with Jonna, that Neil would not support any of it. <laughs> he, <laughs> yeah. would tell, yeah. he would tell me that I'm an idiot for spending all this money on building a kit to play like your hero because you're probably not even going to like it when you get on it, just like I didn't like my drums when I set them up like Keith Moon. And he'll, he'll be 100% right. And he's just yeah. going to look down and he's going to laugh at me. But I'm going to look up and I'm going to go, I'm the only guy that's got the right Tom stands. <laughs> yeah, and you'll say, I don't care. I I'm don't doing care. it anyway. Yeah. You know how much work I had to do to build this thing? 
I think it's so cool, man. It's the ultimate tribute. I can't wait to see it when it's all done, too. That's I just so got to get Lauren down here to set it up for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're talking about Lauren Wheaton, the Lauren great Wheaton, drum the tech, only. who worked also for Steve Smith yes, and also did. works for Keith Carlock. Also worked for John Tempesta, too. And John Tempesta. Yeah. Great, great drum tech. Great guy. That's how Johnny's got that Neil symbol. It's the only thing I'm missing. I need, I actually need a piece of Neil equipment. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mr. Danette, if you'd like to sell one of those symbols at an actual human price, can, can you let me know? <laughs> I think Don Bennett oh. said it's selling like something is for like two hundred and fifty thousand oh dollars for a snare drum. I'm like, dude, yeah. come on, man. No, I know. Like, can some of us mortals who are not millionaires, you know, how? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> people, well, are buddy, jacked up in, people are jacking yeah. up in memorabilia, insane. I, yeah. I saw, I have an R40 snare drum that I bought from DW when they first came out at artist cost. And I don't even remember what I paid for, probably 1500 bucks, maybe something like that, somewhere between one and $2,000. I just saw one sell for 15 grand. Wow. 15 grand. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. So, you know, the, Sadly, the devil on my shoulder goes, well, if you ever need money, at least you can sell that drum, that and my bell brass, I could get $20,000 for it. But you know, it's like, it, it, it's, it, it's insane the amount that the markup has gone with anything yeah. now that's real, yeah. that if you tag Neil Peart to it, forget it. All these yeah. candy apple red drums, anything, you, if you try to find them, first of all, they're scarce as hell. And then if you do find some, people are just asking outrageous prices for them. There's a guy who wanted... $999 for an eight inch Tom. And I, I just messaged him. I'm like, cause he said he had some other sizes available too. And I messaged him to find out what he had. And I was like, not for nothing. I just got an eight by nine. I said, I just got an eight by nine, which is more rarer than your eight by eight for $300. And like, I'm not selling my drums for $300. Like screamed it back to me. I was like, I, I never asked you to. I just, yeah. told you, <laughs> I got that. I was like, Whoa, bro. I'm like, all right. You know, uh, I saw the, the, the Tama banners from back in the day. Oh, uh, yeah. It yeah. has, you know, him on the on the barge, which I have one in my in my drum room. I saw one of those going for six grand the other day. I was like, who is going to, who has money to spend $6,000 on a fucking tapestry? <laughs> that's the thing. Once somebody pays it, then everybody thinks that's the price. You know, well, that's, that's, that's it too. It's like every, that's the problem is that any, anything is worth something, but whether or not you can get that price for it is yeah. really what it's worth. Like my bell brass, for example, just a, a regular real stock old Tama bell brass. You know, those are, those are yeah. highly sought after. Yeah. That's a five to $6,000 drum easy if you put that up on eBay with the hoops. That's a five to $6,000 drum all day. But the people that put them up, put them up for 10, 12 20 yeah. like dude come on yeah no it's that's crazy and yeah and the more scarce they get the more they can be feel justified to to yeah charge those like kinds those, of prices like the slingling artist like i showed you the five that i've yeah. a, i've acquired downstairs aside from the one that he signed i've gotten all of those within the last couple of years but i have one of those by the way do you yeah hello uh, white marine pearl. Want to see it? Yeah, I do. I got it from my father-in-law. Really? Could use a cleanup. Oh, well, that's a nice one. Yeah, it's. Let me see the inside. Is that the chocolate milk interior? Uh, I... it is. It, I I think it is. It's not. Oh. It's not see-through maple. It's like a like a gray. You're right. Now, you're right. now that you say that, I had yeah. They, really... they call it they call it chocolate milk interior because that's what it looks like. Yeah. yeah. It's I've a got, great sounding I've, drum. I've got, uh, I've got two that are chocolate milk interior, and my other four are all are clear maple interior. But they're all three plies, just like the one he used. But they're going up, and I've I I. I have a strict policy is I won't pay any more than $400 for one because that's what they're worth. They're worth three to $400, even in great shape. Yeah. These guys yeah. that are asking six, seven, eight, 
you're going to be sitting there waiting all day to, to, to get a drum that expensive. If you're going to price it out that, that much. Yeah. The only one, the only one I spent more than four on was the, the green satin flame one, because that's a rare finish. And that was worth 425. Yeah, no, I hear you. Well, buddy, we're going to have to wrap it. Cause we're, we're at about an hour and 20. <laughs> awesome. This has been so great. It's been so good to catch up. I'm glad we got to cover all these, these things. And it has been, and I, I want to, I want to thank you for having me on here. Um, I also want to thank you too. And, and a lot of people have probably read this on Facebook for, for you always being the guy in my corner with the Zildjian company, even though you're no longer there, but you know, without you, I would have never been at the company. Um, oh, and thanks, and I, I almost, I wrote that thing a little bit differently before I actually edited it and then put it out. Cause what I wrote first was, it was a more heartfelt thing towards you, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to have it be all about Johnny D and then not, no. you know, not mention the other folks and whatnot. Right. But like I had said, you know, this guy was always in my corner and I wrote in capital letters. He never tried to poach me, you know, always by the books, just like, Hey, I'm always here. If you ever want to ever, ever thinking about it, knock on my door. And just the fact that I surprised the shit out of you when you thought I was going to give you a stick contract. And I'm like, no, I want to do the symbol thing. What? I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember. I remember. And I'm so glad. Um, thank you for saying that. And, and as I said, and I meant it, it was one of my, my most proudest signings when, when you came yeah, on board. That makes and, me and I'm, great. And, I, and, and I'm glad you said that too, Jason, because there's some good people, you know, Joe Test is a good friend of mine and he's great there people. and, yeah. Well, the and best thing is that, you know, and Eric and all. Yeah. Those and, and Eric and Kirsten, and the best thing about, you know, Joe being there is like, Joe was always my friend. I mean, I've known Joe yeah. as long as I've known all you guys. I just never worked with Joe because I never, I never went to Vic Firth. So that's why we never worked together, but we were always friends. So yeah. that was, a, that was seamless. It's like, I, I, I do like when sadly if someone goes, but if it's re if they're replaced by someone I already know or work with, it just makes it so much easier for me. Like, absolutely. For example, like I know we had our differences, but when Aaron came, it sucked. First of all, the, the whole Promark thing was a is, is a, all my friends. I love Kevin, but Kevin got replaced by Marco. Well, shit, I'm probably even more friends closer to Marco than I was with Kevin because I knew Marco for another decade before Kevin. Because I used to buy symbols off Marco in New York for Christ's sakes back in the eighties. Yeah. So. But then Aaron took over for Marco. Well, I was already work. I already worked with Aaron at Tama. So it it's one of those things where like someone comes out of the mix, but they're replaced by someone I already know. I go, oh, okay. I don't have to, I'm not going to have to worry. I'm not going to have to explain to this guy who I am. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I'm not going to have to fight for a position. It just makes, makes a, lot a of big difference. difference. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, I'm glad to hear that too. Yep. Yeah. You're in good hands there. I know that. I know that. <laughs> All right, my friend. Well, listen, we'll, we'll hang, hang tight for one second. I'll end the stream and we'll come back to the, to the room and uh, we'll discuss when we're going to strawberry fair. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I look forward to that. Awesome. But a big hand, everybody for Jason Bittner. Thanks for tuning in today. Thanks, everybody. Sorry if I sounded a little froggy at times, um, but fine. We're, we're all going to hang in there. So we'll see you all soon. All right.